Hello everybody, welcome to uh, week 8 of the Vatstar Private Pilot Ground School. Um, this week we're going to get into some stuff about, uh, you know, basic background navigation uh, and how we can apply that to the things that we're going to uh, need for the P1 rating. So we're going to talk about uh, pilotage, time, uh, magnetic variation, magnetic deviation, the wind triangle, as well as uh, airspace. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, things that you're going to need en route while you're flying. So pilotage is the use of visible landmarks to maintain a desired course. Um, and those visible landmarks uh, can be identified either on an aeronautical chart. Um, sometimes local areas will have like um, set procedures. I know here on Long Island, we have some prominent landmarks uh, like power plants. But typically, um, if you look at the sectional chart and you see a purple flag, those are good visible landmarks. They're also VFR checkpoints. Um, but these checkpoints allow you to proceed from one point to another uh, and essentially look out the window uh, to figure out which direction you need to fly to get to your destination. So those aeronautical charts that you're commonly going to use are going to be those VFR sectional charts, and we'll have a couple in here, uh, as well as the VFR terminal area chart, and in very rare cases, the world aeronautical chart. Um, so the scale of that aeronautical chart, of the sectional chart, is 1 to 500,000. So that's essentially 1 inch is 6.8. Uh, or 6.9 nautical miles, um, and these are designed for visual navigation in VFR conditions. So they uh, portray things like the terrain, those VFR checkpoints, populated places, which are going to be indicated in yellow shading, uh, roads, railroads, and then some other distinct landmarks that you might be able to um, point out from the air. So uh, you know, on top of that sectional chart, we also have the terminal area chart. These are kind of more um, designed for like cities. Uh, so these have a smaller scale. It's about one inch is three miles, or about three and a half miles uh, or nautical miles. Uh, and these again are near large cities that have class Bravo airspace, and they're they're designed to have much more detail, um, kind of blow everything up to a larger scale so that you can more easily uh, see detail and see the prominent features of a general area. So you'll use these again navigating around these larger cities. And then finally, uh, the final chart we have is the World Aeronautical Chart. You really can't find these, and uh, at least not nowadays, and, and they're not really kept up to date. They're updated probably yearly or, or maybe every two years. And these have a scale of one to one million. So you would really only use these on long distance VFR cross countries, which aren't too common. Um, but again, they do exist. You can find them, uh, but you do have to order them from uh, the FAA or whatever the uh, publishing agency that creates the charts for your individual country. Uh, they have a lot, a lot smaller detail, but they show like railroads, larger airspace, like Charlie's and Bravo's. Um, and uh, and and show populated areas again in a much smaller uh, context. So, if you're learning uh, or interested in learning how to decode these charts, uh, we're not going to go over that in this lesson. But uh, the link is there if you just Google FAA.gov um, Aeronautical Chart Users Guide. Uh, it will pop up uh, and give you kind of every symbol that you might want to know. Uh, so let's talk about time, right? So um, the world is made up, right, uh, or maps use a series of lines referred to as longitude and latitude. Latitude lines are parallel with the equator. The equator is where the sun directly hits, or zero degrees on the uh, Earth. And then lines of longitude, which are uh, lines that run from the North Pole to the South Pole, and they allow us to divide up the Earth into, uh, into coordinated areas and also into time zones. And if we look at the picture here, right, we have lines of longitude that run north to south. Uh, zero degrees would fall at the prime meridian, which is uh, over here in Greenwich, England. And then lines of lo uh, latitude, which end at uh, the equator, zero degrees. So time is measured in relation to the rotation of the Earth. A day is defined as the time required for the Earth to make one complete revolution. Uh, it's, you know, officially 23 hours, 56 minutes, and I think four seconds. Um... But we ran that into 24 hours, and obviously that's why we have a leap year every once in a while. That's to add or account for that extra day, since a day isn't exactly 24 hours. Um, but it follows that the Earth resolves, uh, or revolves at uh, a rate of 15 degrees every hour. And that's why each time zone is 15 degrees, right? There's 360 degrees in a sphere uh, or a circle. 
uh, we divide that 24 hours, that makes it so there's 15 degrees for each hour or every time zone. Um, now, because there are 24 time zones and aircraft are constantly crossing through them, uh, it was necessary early on to establish like a standardized time that everybody's going to use as a reference. Now, this is referred to as Zulu time or uh, universal time coordinated or UTC. And Zulu time is that time in Greenwich, England. And nearly all time in aviation is referred to at this time zone. So respectively, for each time zone, uh, we have to convert to and from Zulu time uh, to see what time that's going to be locally as operations typically happen on local time. Now, um, uh, let, let's kind of go over this, right? There's a problem. Let's say an aircraft departs an airport in the Pacific Standard Time Zone at 10.30 Pacific Standard Time for a four-hour flight to an airport in the Central Standard Time Zone. The landing should be at what time uh, UTC? So first, let's convert PST to UTC, right? So the conversion is eight hours. PST to UTC is eight hours. So 10.30 plus eight hours is 18.30 US UTC. So that's 6.30 p.m. Universal Time Coordinated. And then we add the four hours of flight time. That's 2230 UTC. Now, in some cases, you might want to convert back to see uh, where it is, wherever you're going. Right. If you're going to Central Standard Time, that would be a six hour conversion back. So uh, 1030 minus 630 is uh, 430 p.m. So we'd be landing at 430 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. Um now, all lines of longitude converge on one place of the planet. That's referred to as true north. There's also true south, which is at the south pole. Um, however, the north pole, the magnetic north pole, which attracts the needle of a compass, is magnetic north, and those points are not the same. Uh, so there are different lines. There are lines uh, from north to south that you know go to magnetic north and magnetic south. And then there's true north and true south. Now, the angular difference between those uh, lines is called magnetic variation. And we'll actually see that on the sectional chart. There are purple dashed line. Those are isogonic lines. Um, a course measured on the sectional chart, right, when we draw a line from point A to B, is a true course. So that's using that true north and true south, not magnetic north and magnetic south. So why is that important? Well, the compass in the airplane, which is used to maintain a course, is... Um, showing that magnetic north. So we need to figure out how to convert from one to the other for uh, from when we plan to when we actually fly. Uh, and that's used by adding or subtracting that variation. So to convert a true course to a magnetic course, we must subtract the easterly uh, variation and add the westerly variation. So east is least, west is best. That's how we remember that. So for example, at Astoria, Oregon, there's a variation of 15 degrees, 30 minutes east. We'll just round that up to 16 degrees east. Uh, this means from any line that we draw, we have to subtract 15 degrees to determine what we fly according to our uh, directional gyro or, or our magnetic compass. So if we draw a line and let's say it says we need to fly a 030 heading, uh, that's our true course. To see what we would fly in the airplane that's using magnetic heading, we would subtract 16. So 30 minus 16 is 14. We're going to fly a 014 heading in the airplane. Uh, and obviously, this isn't accounting for uh, wind variation or wind angle. Uh, that you would also need to add or subtract. So uh, the magnetic compass is also affected by influences within the aircraft, such as electrical circuits, radios, engines, magnetized metal parts, or, or et cetera, et cetera. So that actually causes the magnet in the compass to be deflected from its normal reading. And this is known as deviation. It's different from variation. Uh, deviation is actually different for every aircraft because different aircraft have different magnetic influences, right? They might have slightly different mag uh, metal compositions or different avionics installed. Uh, and that causes uh, courses to vary in the airplane. So there may be a correction necessary that's individual for each airplane, and a correction card as a result of that is mounted near the compass. So true course right is uh, determined by measuring the course on an aeronautical chart or seeing where the line is pointed. True airspeed is known by applying the appropriate correction to the indicated airspeed as a result for, you know, temperature and pressure. Um, the wind triangle, which is here on the right, shows how winds aloft, which are those atmospheric wind conditions, may affect a flight speed or path. Now, by knowing those winds aloft and direction, true airspeed and true course, we can figure out what our track across the ground is going to be as well as our ground speed. Now, why is that important? 
well, our ground speed allows us to see, um, you know, where we're going to, uh, how fast we're going to be traveling over the ground, which is necessary to calculate our estimated time of arrival and estimated time en route. And our ground track is important because we need to track our true course over the ground. Now, to, to calculate all of this, you can learn to use an E6B flight computer. We're not going to go over this. Um, for our purposes, you can just use a calculator online, a digital calculator that uh, will give you all this information. But a wind triangle on the right here, this shows our wind speed and directions coming from the right. Um, our true heading is we're going to be pointed into this true heading. And this is going to be how fast we're traveling uh, uh, through the air mass. But over the ground, and in reality, we're going to be tracking over this true course and traveling the speed over this green line. So, airspace. Um, there's a couple different types. We have um, Gulf, Echo, Delta, Charlie, Bravo, Alpha. So, airspace is divided up into uh, its controlled, um, how it's controlled, and um, the uh, entry requirements. Uh, to enter each individual airspace. There's so certain equipment that's required for certain airspace. So class alpha for P1 purposes, you're just going to stay out of that. You need an IFR flight plan to enter the class alpha airspace as well as you need to be instrument rated. Class echo airspace, you can kind of think of echo as anywhere there's not any other kind of airspace is where echo is. So where, where it's not alpha and where it's not Gulf, Bravo, Charlie, or Delta, it's echo. Uh, class Bravo is where you find much larger uh, airports, right? International airports, JFK, Los Angeles, Chicago. Class Charlie is like uh, smaller, um, but not quite very small or not just a towered airport. It has approach services. Those are Charlie airspaces, uh, and they offer approach services as well as like separation and things like that. Those are like smaller cities like Oakland, um, Islip, where I am. Um, then deltas are right like the smallest controlled airports that exist. Those are class deltas, and they have uh, just a tower. And class Gulf, right? Those are uncontrolled areas that are um, specified typically over like a very small training airport. And they have uh, different VFR weather minimums that are different of that from Echo, so you can go fly in that airspace, um, you know, under uh, less or lesser weather or worse weather conditions. Um, so airspace right is defined in the two categories: controlled and uncontrolled. Controlled airspace is that Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and Echo. Uh, all of this airspace besides Echo requires permission to enter. Um, in the United States, only Class Gulf is uncontrolled airspace. So how is that airspace defined, right? Class Alpha is from 18,000 to 60,000. Uh, Class Bravo is typically from the surface to 7,000 AGL. Class Gulf is typically from the surface to 700 AGL, in some cases up to 14,500. Class Charlie is typically from the surface to 4,000 AGL. Delta is typically from the surface to 2,500 AGL. Um, and they all have their own uh, entry requirements. So class alpha, you need an ATC clearance. You need to be IFR equipped and you need an instrument rating. Class Bravo, you need an explicit ATC clearance. You need two-way radio and a transponder with altitude reporting capability. Uh, and you need at least a private, however, a student, recreational, or sport pilot may enter uh, if you get a uh, certain regulatory requirement for a recreational sport pilot, you need an endorsement. For a student pilot, uh, you need an endorsement, and you're actually not allowed to even operate there as a student pilot, at least not at the airport. Class Charlie, all you need is two-way radio communication to enter. However, uh, equipment-wise, you need a two-way radio and a transponder with altitude or otherwise known as mode C. There's no minimum pilot cert to enter. Class Delta, you need two-way radio communications as well as a two-way radio, no transponder necessary, and no specific equipment. Class Echo, although controlled, you don't need to contact ATC to enter um, for VFR. There's also no specific requirement and no specific requirement for pilot license. Um, Class Golf, don't need any uh, entry uh, requirements. There's no equipment required and no pilot requ uh, certificate required other than uh, an endorsement if you're a student pilot. Uh, but however, in the U.S., as of January 1st, ADSB out equipment is required in certain airspace, like above a Class Charlie, up to 10,000 it's required. Uh, above 10,000 at all altitudes it's required. Um, 
in class echo above 10,000 MSL it's required except below 2,500 AGL. Uh, so there's all these requirements that you need to enter a uh, certain airspace, which again, if you'd like, you can research uh, FAA's website it has a lot of great resources for that. So uh, I would take a Q&A, but obviously this is a recording. Um, so if you learn something or have any questions, leave a comment below uh, and I'll try to get back to you or have Vatstar respond to you guys in the comments. And uh, I hope to get our live classes back soon. I've been very, very busy. I just passed my flight instructor check ride. Uh, and I'm hoping to be able to record the final two lessons for you guys uh, and have you guys participate in person. I'll try to get those out as soon as possible and I'll make sure the information of how to attend is out there as soon as possible. So thanks for coming. That concludes our lesson and uh, I'll see you guys uh, soon. Bye-bye.